Welcome, this is the first module of the Enterprise Storage Provider Accelerator Bootcamp with a total of 19 modules. And that does not include additional keynotes and guest presentations that we had in Las Vegas. Each module is accompanied by a more detailed document that is linked on the Filecoin website or in the ESPA learning management system. The flow of modules goes from conceptual to financial and legal and business, including sales and marketing, and then we dig deeper into the technical material. This slide here is a high-level view of the content that this particular module will cover, starting with blockchain technology, then Web3 and decentralization, followed by customer demand, pricing, Filecoin economics, competitive landscape, and then we end up with the congressional testimony of Protocol Labs Head of Council, Marta Belcher. This is not a technical deep dive into blockchain, but really more of a business view. And thus we have to really ask the question, why is blockchain important? And as a simple answer, we'll say business runs on information. The faster it's received and the more accurate it is, the better. And that's a solution or problem that blockchain can really help us solve. So today, we hear about different types of blockchains. There's public blockchain, private, hybrid, consortium. But what's important in a Web3 context is that we use the definition that applies to the public blockchain that uses the following characteristics. First of all, blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business network. Blockchain is ideal for delivering that information because it provides immediate, shared, and completely transparent information stored on an immutable ledger. A blockchain network can track orders, payments, accounts, production, and much, much more. And because it provides a single view of the truth, everybody can see all the details of a transaction from end to end, giving you greater confidence as well as greater efficiencies and new opportunities. No participant can change or tamper with a transaction after it's been recorded to the shared ledger. Each additional block strengthens the verification of the previous block and hence the entire blockchain. This renders the blockchain tamper evident, delivering the key strength of immutability. This removes the possibility of tampering by a malicious actor and builds a ledger of transactions you and other network members can trust. The more participants that are participating in a blockchain, the more secure it is. However, non-public blockchains are missing one or more of these important attributes. The term Web 1 generally describes everything from the earliest interconnection of computers in the 1970s and the 1980s to the first flowering of browsers and websites in the 1990s. Then we heard the term Web 2, and often that was accompanied with the concept of cloud computing. These were companies that built applications on top of that, from social media to search engines to wikis, much of it based on content generated by end users. Although that made much of the web in one sense decentralized, most of the things were still run through big companies. The idea of Web3 is to create software and platforms that aren't dependent on traditional companies and Web2 business models, such as advertising. For example, users might pay for services directly using tokens. In an ideal world, Web3 services are operated, owned, and improved upon by communities of users. How does decentralization fit into all of this? And it's important to note that Web3 characterization of decentralization, rather than a, a kind of a common understanding of decentralization that might be thrown around. In the context of decentralized storage, it does not mean distributed storage media. As an example, Google Cloud Platform shards, encrypts, and then distributes files around the world when you store their data on their platform. But this does not make them a Web3 storage provider. Notice the definition focuses on central authority. Decentralized storage is built around open openness, open source, user control of relationships and pricing. A decentralized system does not cease to work if an organization fails. So when looking at the Google Cloud Platform example, it doesn't fit this definition whatsoever because all the authority is derived from a central authority, a central entity that's making choices for you. Web3 really is the third generation of the internet. It's a global network that permits intelligent interactions between all of its users and devices. 
So let me dig a little bit into some of these attributes of Web3 that are really critical. You can see on the slide, it's summarized and differentiated between Web2 and Web3. But I wanna point out some things in particular. Today's world of Web2 uses a centralized DNS system, but this is being superseded by decentralized systems like Interplanetary File System, IPFS for short, which is content-driven, decentralized, blockchain-based, faster, and more secure. There is no central authority where it goes down, the network ceases to operate. This is a problem in the DNS structure of today where there's a few critical nodes that run the entire DNS system for the world. Another attribute that's important is digital identities. This is a technology that was spawned by the blockchain and it may become one of the most important features of Web3. The point is that Web2 is infested with cybercrime of every description from identity theft to click fraud using a very primitive model of identity. Perhaps Web3's most important contribution is its primary use, its ability to create cryptocurrencies, and particularly the ability to use such currencies to make micropayments. Some might argue that the blockchain's most important contribution is automated trust. This is the building of what we call trustless networks. We actually trust those networks based on their algorithms, but the participants don't have to be trusted. Unlike uh, Web2 platforms where you're dealing with somebody you know and trust and you hope they're going to follow through on their commitments, if you look at something like Bitcoin, you can see Payments can be made between two parties that have no idea who they are. You just have an address and you abide by the protocol and make sure that they don't break the rules. And that's enforced by the algorithm. Finally, what I think is the most critical aspect of Web3 is user control. So instead of a central authority controlling and demanding what has to happen on their platform, user control puts it back in the hand of the end users, making decisions for themselves. Now, big data and artificial intelligence, that could equally well serve individuals if you take control of your data and you collaborate in finding effective ways to use that data. But it won't be by somebody harvesting your information without your knowing about it or realizing it. It'll be by you consciously choosing to share that information where you have control over the payments and not some advertiser. This chart shows examples, representatives of some of these types of structures. And then we correlate that with the types of services they might be providing. You'll see if you look through that Web2 column that a lot of that business model is built on either advertising dollars or collecting and selling information about you. The, the chart on the right shows you how quickly the market cap is growing. Now, what would all this mean if there wasn't some kind of customer interest, if there wasn't demand? So if we look at the very, the very raw aspect of storage, experts believe there's roughly 64 zettabytes of data that's been collected and stored in all sorts of manners, you know, whether it's been in private data centers, in the cloud, on USB sticks, wherever, private machines. This number of 64 zettabytes is expected to double every two years. So there's certainly demand. And a lot of this is being driven by automation and sensors, machine-to-machine -machine communications, IoT, Internet of Things, IIoT, industrial Internet of Things, artificial intelligence and machine learning, all hungry for data. And indeed, that, that's where our value is stored in that data. Now to focus on decentralized storage, to focus on Filecoin specifically, we want to show how Filecoin plays into this market. We look on the right-hand side of the archiving revenue globally of paid archiving services, and you can see a growth of roughly a billion dollars per year. On the left-hand side, we show how Filecoin today is embedded in that archiving tier. This is what we excel at, and we expect over the next year or two, we'll move up from a cold archive up into warm storage as Filecoin retrievals become faster and more mature. From a customer standpoint, I have a couple use cases I want to quickly go over. Here, Jonathan Dotan, who will be presenting tomorrow, describes why Filecoin is so important for preserving accurately humanity's most important information. Here, we're talking about data around survivors of genocides around the world and throughout history. It's critical that this data is preserved and can't be modified to tell a different story. So here's another example of important information that's being stored in Filecoin. Now, these data sets are fully open and anybody in the world can retrieve these. We're looking at various types of data, medical data, genomics data, data that's important to share with the rest of the world. And there's an astounding number. I mean, we're already at 21 petabytes of the actual data. And then there's multiple replicas that allow safeguarding the data. So if one data set gets erased or deleted, there's other replicas in the system that can replace and rebuild that. 
Now, when it comes to pricing on the Filecoin network, as I mentioned earlier, there is no central authority to tell you what to charge for your services for storing data or retrieval. And we'll use a market mechanism. That is, you get to decide and there's others out there who can offer competitive options. When we look and compare to some of the Web2 pricing, the best Web2 pricing, you can say, well, they're only charging 99 cents per terabyte per month. But in reality, that doesn't include retrieval. So you might spend thousands of dollars storing your data in a uh, traditional Web2 provider, only to find out it can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to retrieve that data. And indeed, some of the people we've worked with have found that out the hard way. So bottom line is Filecoin Network offers a significantly lower price point to Web2 alternatives, which attracts customers, as well as some mechanisms to help you become profitable at that. So here we did a survey of some of the Web2 pricing that's out in the market today. And you can see on the left, this is where Filecoin and Picnic, frankly, operate. This pricing, which is per terabyte per month, increases dramatically. Now I want to cover some of the economics in a very brief single slide manner. I can't do it justice in a single slide, but after this module, Andrew's going to take a deeper dive and go much deeper into the economics. So stay tuned for that. In addition to pricing, you may charge for storing and retrieval of data. Filecoin as a system offers an incentive program in the form of block rewards for storing proven data. Now this is called proof of storage. This calculation is based on adjusted power, which including additional incentives for verified data that the community values, offers a very economical way to offset your costs. Over time, this incentive is decreasing. So it's really for those who join the market early and get into this system early, build up your customer base with real market forces to allow you to charge the kind of prices you need to charge. Now let's look at more of a competitive view for other storage protocols that are being advertised as Web3 or next generation storage protocols. You probably recognize some of these names, SIA, Storage, Arweave, BitTorrent, Holo, and this gives you a sense of how Filecoin differentiates itself from them. Now let's take a closer look at some of these other competitive services that are frequently talked about in the financial world or the DeFi world, the decentralized finance world where Web3 is, is all the rage. Let's point out some of these differences in this, uh, in this slide here. One of the first things you'll notice is how much data is being stored, actual data is being stored by these different systems. Filecoin is greater today at 33 petabytes. This snapshot, I believe, is from December of 2021. So it's already grown a little bit beyond that. But when you look at Arweave, Arweave is at 39 terabytes, not petabytes. That's one thousandth the amount that's in a petabyte. So they're well behind several orders of magnitude behind in terms of the actual data is consumed. But that's understandable where they're charging more than $30,000 for what they call permanent storage. You pay $30,000 per terabyte and ostensibly will be around forever. There's some skepticism about whether that business model will work or not, but we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And then there's storage which is at eight petabytes of real data. They've been around about as long as Filecoin, but they're charging $4 per terabyte per month, and that's a fixed price. You don't get to negotiate that. You're part of the system. That's what they charge their, their users. But as a storage provider, you get paid whatever they uh, think is the right amount. Another thing that's absolutely critical is network capacity. How much data could be stored today if you had a customer that says, well, I've got 100 petabytes of data I want stored. That's truly enterprise class. The Filecoin network has a capacity today of, well, this slide shows 14 and a half peta, uh, exabytes. Today, it's actually in excess of 15 exabytes. So there's plenty of capacity to store a lot of data as it comes on board. Arweave does not report their capacity. I do know that part of their model is to grow additional nodes in order to pay for this idea of permanent storage. From what we've seen over the last year, they're, they're, the amount of nodes on their network is actually decreasing. So it's very hard to uh, understand what their capacity is or could be. And then finally, uh, we see with storage, they've got 13 petabytes of complete network capacity. That would make it impossible if you had a 100 petabyte deal in terms of onboarding that uh, data. Then we take a little de deeper dive into this. You can see the pros and cons of each one, you know, where they play best. There's no argument. Filecoin is, is just huge and we can accommodate data from enterprises. Arweave, again, as I mentioned, they have this business model that argues that they have permanent storage 
where for $30,000 per terabyte, they'll store your data forever. But there's some concern about the, uh, the mechanics of that and whether that's actually something that they can pull together. And then we talked about storage earlier and how it's not a trustless system like Filecoin. It, there's a centralized satellite system that controls the system, sets the pricing, and basically you are, as a storage provider, you're basically an outsourced hard drive. You're being paid for capacity and, and data stored on your node, and you're very limited as to what, uh, what role you play. You certainly don't play a role in setting price and marketing your services to uh, potential clients. Now, in the US, we've seen a big debate about the role of crypto and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Internationally, we've seen a lot of news about other nations and the approaches they're taking to crypto. Our head of policy of Protocol Labs, Marta Belcher, who's also the board chair of the Filecoin Foundation, spoke before the US Senate Banking Committee back in July of 2021 and had to present her view. And it was very well received. She compared Web3 and crypto to the early days of the internet with the next round of innovation shaping the internet and not to be looking at this with blinders, thinking about the bad things that can happen because certainly the good on the internet can outweigh the bad. The benefits, the innovation that can be brought, the way it can change our world for better. Today where there's a lot of discussion in Congress about the role of these big cloud storage providers, the, the clout they wield, their ability to to silence people holding information that they want to share and uh, basically controlling our speech is a concern that uh, she brought up. So here we're seeing the positive side. And again, the Senate received that extremely well to see the other side of the coin, that there's a positive influence that Web3 has upon the world today. So finally, I want to remind you, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's an accompanying document that has much more detail about this module and other modules coming up that's linked at the Filecoin website. Our ESPA participants can also find these modules on the learning management system. Now, our next module is called Filecoin Economics, and I will turn this over to Andrew Stanko, who's our Vice President of Finance at Picnic. Thank you.